it man oh man can can somebody call a doctor <laughs> deb please check him out i'm begging you deb get him a protein shake something just very very quickly on what we just sang and i'm not, I'm not doing this because we don't have anything else to do but look at 55 22 psalm i'm sorry psalm 55 22 it's my fault if i didn't tell you that you should have known that psalm 55 22 the Bible says this, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. What did you just sing? Take your burden to him. Whatever you are weighed down with, there's nothing he is not acquainted with. Jonah, quick. Jonah. Jonah chapter number 2, verse 1 says this, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cry by reason of mine affliction to the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy, waves and thy, uh, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Now go with me to Matthew 16. This is just a quick little Bible study. Go to Matthew 16. So we just sung a song about Christ has the victory and he rose from the dead. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus my Savior. He did what? He tore the... So hell is an eternal prison with bars on it. Kenny, you work at a jail? Brother Herbert works at a jail. You get life, man. 
I mean, you might get used to the routine, but think about that. You're never getting out. That's what hell is until you get out to go to the great white throne. Look what the Bible says with me in Matthew 16. Pick it up with me in verse number oh, 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? That's a good Bible definition of what ye is. Ye is plural. It's them. Not confusing. Ye is plural. T is singular. 16 says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for, son, uh, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, he's talking about himself, not Peter. Peter's not the rock of the church. Jesus Christ is. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So hell has bars and hell has gates. Last one, Revelation 1. Then we'll get to a couple questions, and we'll get into the rapture. Well, not really, unless the Lord says, come up hither, then we'll really get into the rapture, man. Hey, you know what? No, nothing, <laughs> nothing that can't be solved by hearing that trump. Not the one with the red hat and the long red tie. <sighs> if that's your hope, there's something wrong with you. Seriously. The Bible says this in Revelation 1, 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. He's the one that can amen his own preaching. And have the keys of hell and of death. If you want to get out of that eternal prison, you got to go see the one that has the keys to the devil. And his name is Jesus Christ. He tore the bars away. Jesus my Savior. Opened up that gate, snatched those keys, walked across the great gulf of water and met the thief as he said he would and all in before the next day even started. That's why you and I have victory, because our Savior is alive. Don't ever bother comparing Muhammad or Buddha to Jesus Christ. Are you serious? I don't care how many billions of people that offends. You ought to stop being offended and go research this for yourself where they with the conscience God gave you instead of darkening that conscience through religion and self-righteousness and all that stuff, and go see the one who actually went to hell for you and rose again the third day. That's why you're never going to beat the Savior. Nobody has been to hell for you. He has. I hear people talk all the time. You, see, you hear it on TV shows about you know the war movies. What do people that go through war always say? I, listen, I, I've never been in war, never been in armed combat. I, can, I cannot even imagine. My uncle was in Iwo Jima, and he wouldn't even talk about it. I can't imagine what it's like in Vietnam, that napalm and that stuff. I can't even imagine how hellish it must have been, but that's not hell. And you haven't been to hell and back. I only know of two people. One's named Jonah, one is Jonah, who's a type of Jesus Christ, Matthew 12, and I know the, the real one, Jesus Christ. Pretty wild stuff, man. So when you sing those songs, they're supposed to have singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They're supposed to have doctrine. They're supposed to admonish one another. They're supposed to teach you because they're based on the Word of God. That's, that's, that's why we sing the songs we do. And I'm not, I'm not saying the hymns are infallible. They're not inspired. But if I can find the hymns basis, scripturally sound, rightly divided, then we're, we're going to sing it, man. The Bible says this. Never mind, we got questions first. Ha ha ha, you got you suckered in, yeah. All right, what was the condition of the men, David's 400 men, in the cave? If you want an alliterative message, this is it. I want the verse that goes along with it. He's, there's three things that da those 400 men that go to the cave with David are described as it's very vivid. Preached on it uh, last year. Uh, three things. They all begin with D. Do you remember that? All right, give, give, give me, somebody give me one of them. Pauly, you, this big time because you're teaching Sunday, maybe. If you get this right, go ahead. You only want one? I only want one for now. In debt. In debt. Bingo. That's one of them. Justin, what, what do you got? Give me one more. Some, uh, no, just give, just give me one more. Okay, in debt and in distress. Thank you. What's the last one? I'm trying to give somebody else. I know you know you got a kid, man. I mean, you're you're reared up, man. You got you got extra. 
extra energy drink in here? Oh, you're, are you looking around right now? You're not so sure now, are you? Or are you just trying to look around to avoid my eyes staring at you? No. Do you got it? Yeah. Okay. I want to, I'm giving some. Haley, give it a shot. Nope. You're not going to be preaching Sunday if you can't get these D's down. <laughs> now, Justin has the verse. And I'm sure you guys, have you guys found out where the, where the verse is? And it'll give you the answer. Do you guys know where it is? Justin, go ahead, man. First Samuel uh, 22. Okay, let's everybody, let's everybody get there. First Samuel 22, read verses 1 and 2. You, got, you guys got two out of three, man. This is the one I struggle with too, man. I've got I to be honest with you for, for once. This is the one I struggle with. So, Justin, read 22, 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave at Dulum. Mm -hmm. And when his brother and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, there you go. gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Thank you. So, distress, debt, discontented. And then the Psalms that go, do you guys remember the Psalms we preach out that go with that? Do you remember the two Psalms that match up to that? Uh, Psalm, go ahead. 142 is one of them. Yep. What's the other one? So you have, make a little note there. If you uh, by by verse number uh, verse number one, if you want Psalm 142 is correct, Haley. Do you have the other one? That will actually. So if you had to, you know, go back and get the real life play by play of the details, the other one is Psalm 57. So Psalm 57 and Psalm 142 are when David is specifically in the cave. Just something to think of. I mean. That's why we like to read the headings, because those headings are part of Scripture, and they also give you like a cliff note version of a spot in David's life, like when he runs from Ahimelech and he scrabbles at the gate, and he, he runs, and David writes a psalm about it. Or he, he's hit himself with the Ziphims, and they write a psalm. I mean, those psalms from about 50, 52 to 60 are really detailed about specific incidences in his life. I mean, phenomenal. And we know Psalm 18 at the beginning. That's actually inspired scripture, man. That title is scripture. So pretty neat how that works out. Kenny, you, you good, man? Okay, I know you're scribulating there. All right, I, I, I'm going to read this, and we're going to have we're going to have another problem. We're going to have another uh, problem text. So let's do this. Go to Matthew 27. Two places: Matthew 27 and Zechariah. Now, for you guys that know this, don't scream it out and say, "I know this one already." Just, let's give it, well, it's not like that voice, but you know what I'm talking about. Go to, go to Matthew 27, and with your other hand, get Zechariah 11, and I would like someone to explain this to me from the Bible, because we have an apparent contradiction again. Matthew 27, verse 1 says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, didn't repent towards God, which is where you're supposed to, according to the book of Acts, repent toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and then I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See the out of that. And he cast on the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver piece and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because of the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought within the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that, field was, uh, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them to the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Now go with me to Zechariah 11. Go to Zechariah 11, please. If you can find Matthew, go back two books. Malachi, the Italian prophet, and then go to Zechariah. Zechariah 11 says this in verse number 10. Zechariah 11:10. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that weighed upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. For they, uh, so they weighed for my price. 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized at of them. 
and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter, uh, cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Then I cut asunder mine own staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So my, my Bible problem for you tonight is Matthew 27 said Jeremy the prophet, but that quotation is found in Zechariah. What's the contradiction going on here? And this is not a difficult one. I'm not being smart when I say that, but I want you to believe every word of God, number one. Every word of God is pure. There are no contradictions in the King James Bible, just that either my carnal mind or my thinking or my lack of study or my, just my flat-out carnality uh, gets in the way of God revealing things to me, or I just haven't got to that point, and God hasn't shown it to me yet. But I want to give you this little twister to get you to think. Remember last week when Megan answered that question about the one day? That was, that was really good, man. 23,000 in one day, and then 24,000 total. That's the correct answer, which harkens back to what? Every word is perfectly in place the way it should be. So let me ask you a question. Brother Bert, you're, I mean, you're foaming right now. I mean, it's like Cujo over there, man. Deb, watch out. He's going to be bad, man. Yeah, yeah that's it. There you go. As Dr. Peacock would say, you married him, stupid. <laughs> but of course, he's looking at me through the camera. That's the way I view it anyway. Anyway, Brother Bert, what, now what's the answer? Biblically. In Matthew 27, 9, it says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet. Ah. What does 2 Peter 1 say? Holy men of God. Who's in charge of writing it down according to 2 Timothy 3.16? God. Somebody get 2 Chronicles uh, 36.22. Deb, can you get... I'll, you know, it won't be someone. It'll be Deb, who just got attacked by a rabid dog. <laughs> can you get 2 Chronicles 36.22? And when you get there, can you read that, please? I know you could, you could pick a bunch of these. We were actually there Sunday night a little bit. But this is a, a very good one that will tie in with what we just read in Matthew 27, 9. Deb, if you got it, fire away. Second Chronicles 36, 22, I believe it is. I hope so. <laughs> there you go. You just read right there. How did Cyrus give the declaration, the proclamation? How did that happen? By what? The mouth of who? What did you read over in Matthew 27, 9? The mouth of Jeremy. So if God inspired that man, that prophet to speak by the Holy Ghost of God, then God's in charge of writing down what was said. You have what God wants for you in that King James Bible, 100%. I don't care what they pull on you, man. I'm not going to re-teach and re-preach Sunday night, man. I don't care what they pull on you, man. You know, unshuls and cursives and all that. Does anybody know what an unshul and a cursive is? No, I'm serious. Now, Brother Bert's laughing because you hear this stuff. when You, you know, I, it, it's good to get into fights with the brethren every once in a while just to see how stupid they are. And yes, that's exactly what I meant. This argumentative about stuff we should be on unity about, the unity of the Spirit of God. What's an unshul and a cursive, Brother Bert? If I remember right, it's been Last decades, I think the uncles are all capital block letters. Yeah. Curses are more local scriptures you want to see. So, but some of you will come to you and say, well, you know, the uncles and the un Are you saying that because you don't think I know what that means? Like the preacher I went up to after he got done with Daniel, and I said, hey, could Daniel 7 be just maybe a, a foreshadowing of the, of the lion with the eagle's wings, and the eagle's wings plucked off the same way? Could that just be a picture of the independence of America, maybe? And I said, I'm not saying that's there, but it's a good figure, lion being you know, Great Britain and the eagle's feathers plucked off, stand by themselves, and then obviously you go through the bear's necks and all that. He goes, brother, I don't think you're exegeting Scripture properly. I've come close to hitting people. That was real close. That was like Muhammad Ali under the jaw and rock em, sock em, no, uh, robots. You know why? Because he was so arrogant that he thought I didn't know what exegeting meant. And he, instead of answering and saying, you know what, brother, maybe that's true, I really don't know, this is the guy that got up in the pulpit, and I'm not going to name his name, the guy that got up in the pulpit said, I'm going to tell you when the rapture is on Thursday night if you come every night to the meeting. Hmm. 
And then he goes, he goes, Thursday night, what do you, so you're, now you're dying to know what he said on Thursday night. Nothing. He said this, he goes, it could happen at any time. Another reason to clock him in the face. Thanks. I had only been reading my Bible through, oh, I don't know how many times since then. And I'm like thinking to myself, this is the guy, why don't you pay me to get up there and preach? I've only been really serving the Lord for a couple of years, but I'm like, I'll get up there and crank it up, man. Be bearing this fool. And if he saved he's my brother in Christ, but he's still an idiot, man. Luring people in. Then I don't, I don't, brother, I don't believe you're exegeting scripture properly. <laughs> I believe if I run you over my car, you're gonna die. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just that stuff wrangles me up, man. Bad. That's why I like saying I've never been to Bible school, just to tick everybody right off. And you can tell by the way you speak, I haven't been to Bible school. All right, number three. Quick, we're, move, we're moving. This is muy rapidamente. I need to... I'm not saying I'm just... What reference? Mm, Second Chronicles 36.22. And Jeremiah 36. And there's a few more. <laughs> anyway. All right, I need to know the will of God tonight. If you don't get this one, I'm going to whip this pulpit like the Hulk at you, man. I need, I need to know the will of God. Now, you just had, I mean, a phenomenal preacher preach this to you. I cannot believe this. No. <laughs> What's that? Run back to the YouTube video. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, Justin, can you give me one of them? And then Estiana's next. Second uh, Peter 3.9. There you go. That would be a good one to start with. What's it say, Brother Justin? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long as suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's a good one to start with. There's a companion to that, if you remember, over in 1 Timothy. Estiana, you are next. Fire away. Amen. 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 Wow, you can't prove the will of God without separating yourself from the world and getting your mind renewed. Wow. Bert and then Haley. Go ahead. First Thessalonians 5.17. There you go. Sorry, Haley, you guys got crushed, didn't you? Go ahead. In everything, give thanks. Amen. Amen. That's a phenomenal one. Haley, you got crushed. You got another one, kid? First Peter 3.17. Okay, and then we'll go to Kenny. You suffer for well doing. Amen. I knew you'd pick that one, Haley. Go ahead. This is the apostle by the will of God. Yeah, this is a cheap shot, Kenny, big time, man. I mean, honestly, this is. Yeah, I know. This is, man, yeah, I don't know. This is the, Bert, don't egg him on, please. Go ahead, Kenny, fire it up. <laughs> I know. Will you poison this cupcake? <laughs> I'm begging you. <laughs> Honestly, Kenny, we didn't cover that on Sunday, but yes, that's the will of God. So that was the will of God, yeah. Paul's the apostle. Jerk weasel. <laughs> go ahead, Taylor. And I get, go ahead, go ahead, Taylor. There you go. Prosperous journey by the will of God. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Amen. Yep. Ah, paying attention when the old man's up here. Good job. Amen. That's good. Deb? Colossians 4, do you want to get that No. Nope. That's it. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Don't think Deb's not listening, man. I'm telling you, she's listening. She is, man. So that's excellent, man. That was the one I, I didn't remember that I told Deb mentioned. That's a real good one, man. Perfect in the will of, all the will of God, man. We don't have to get them all. Just trying to see if you're somewhat paying attention. Brother Bert, you have another one. You're scratching. You got the jaw going. Like, and when you do the itchy uh, you, you <laughs> Now I know Deb wrote them down. Give me one more, Deb. 
That you could actually you could just pick. I know that's a very good section. You can just pick the one if you'd like. Verse three would be really good. Amen. It's good stuff. All right, quickly, we got we got to move quick, man. I need some verses on cloud, clouds, or cloudy. One more time, sir. Does it, what? There's verses on that, right? I always, I didn't like that cloudless morning, man. Oh, there's a bunch of them. I mean, you don't even have to get all fancy, man. I mean, there's a bunch of them. All right, so I have Bert and then Haley again. What are you guys like teaming up or something? Bert's going to take yours again, sir. I'm sorry, man. Go ahead, Bert. Yeah. You mean four seventeen? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Amen. Amen. Haley, go ahead. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's pretty cool, huh? I'm sorry. So, Revelation 1 7, 1 Thessalonians 4 17. What else we got? There's a real good. Uh, I got Polly and then Jonathan. Polly, go ahead. Daniel 7:13. Oh man, the ancient of days, buddy. You're right in my wheelhouse, kid. I saw in the night vision like the son of man came with a cloud of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near. That's so cool, man. The ancient of days. Okay, I have Jonathan. Estiana, Deb, Taylor. Go ahead, John, Jonathan. Exodus 13. Oh, yeah, man. You get, that's, yeah, you were going the cloudy pillar, weren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Amen. I mean, just read that, but think about that for a minute. All the time that happened. He took care of them. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Psalm 121. I'll shade even your right hand now. Estiana, and then Deb, and then Taylor. Oh, yeah, they're going to send up in a cloud your boy, your boys, Moses and Elijah. Go ahead. Cloud received them up. That's pretty cool. I'm going to get, oh, James, I'm telling James is in the house, man, but we're going to go Deb, Taylor, James. Hebrews 12, 1. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 That's cool. A cloud of witnesses. Of course, it's referring to everybody in chapter 11. Taylor, and then James. Oh boy. Mm-hmm. James, go ahead. Uh, Exodus 14, 19, Kenny, you just crushed Kenny's dreams. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> hey, you know what? This is good, man. Yeah, so Did you get your hand up quicker there, Kenny? Estiana had that thing. Boom. I'm on, I'm on it. James, go ahead. Exodus 14. Uh, 19 go ahead. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their camp and stood behind <laughs> That's so cool. And came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. That's wild, man. I don't care. That, that's just wild. Uh, one of Brother Bert's favorite words in the King James Bible was re-reward. <laughs> but it's, it's, the, it's the rear ward. Well, what did the Lord do? 
let me go cover your flank. <laughs> Paul is like, re-reward? That's in the King James Bible? <laughs> That's, oh, yeah, man. <laughs> Megan, did you have one? Fire away. Oh, man, now we're getting into some second coming stuff. Go ahead. Ascribe thee strength unto God, his excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. That is cool. His strength is in the clouds. Okay, Mackenzie has her hand up. Justin, what's going on, buddy? What? No, I'm just saying, hey, go ahead. I know, I, I'm going to go with Mackenzie, then I, and then I'll go, go ahead. Mackenzie, you got one? Nobody did that except for your buddy. Go ahead. Mm hmm. Is that so cool? The appearance of the bow that is in the cloud. Do you remember where that first shows up? The bow in the cloud in Genesis 9. And it's ascribed to the second coming. Something about this. I have, I have to get the non-participants first. SDI. I know you're, I know you're we're, we're, we're juice tonight. And I got, I'm going to go. Go ahead, Justin. And then Jennifer Benoit's going to. We already did this one in Matthew, but here again in Mark, in Mark 9, 7. Mm -hmm. There was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Jen? Yep. Hosea 13, 3. <laughs> You see how many times between the rapture and the sec, particularly the second coming, that thing shows up, man? Those clouds? That's phenomenal. How were they baptized? In a cloud. It's a cloudy day in Ezekiel 30, verse 3. All kinds of stuff going on on that bright and cloudless morning. I don't see that, man. I know we sing it, but just to, how did, unless Brother Bert's got it, go ahead, Brother Bert, go ahead, quick. Uh, and then, and that's. Yeah. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people in the world. He actually descends like in a cloud at the door of the tabernacle, usually. Ask the last one, quickly, please. Acts 1 9. Oh, I haven't heard from Kenny yet. Acts 1 9. Okay. All right, man. All right. And, and what does verse 10 say, just very quickly? And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, he told two men to I'm not 100% saying that's Moses and Elijah, but I wouldn't be shocked if it was. It could be angels. I, there's no, no, I won't give you the hands up thing. I'm just, I'm just, I'm persuaded between, that's what takes them up after they're beheaded and killed. And that's who appears with them when the cloud speaks, this is my beloved son, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elias are there. I would not be biblically shocked at all if that's Moses and Elias, because what's still on tap up until Acts 7? What did they ask the Lord in Acts 1, right in the same chapter, verse number, verse number 6? Is, is is it, is it, you've been talking about this kingdom time. Is it now? Well, you go be witnesses for me after the Holy Ghost empowers you, and then let's see how this plays out with the nation of Israel and the rulers and all that. And then I'll take a seat, and we'll start getting Paul on the stage. Wild stuff, man. I know we have Mrs. Brown, Karen Brown. Go ahead. Proverbs 25, 14. <sighs> Whoso boasts himself. Oh, go ahead. Awesome. Amen. Was that directed towards me, Karen? I'm just saying. I took that kind of, <laughs> took, took that kind of, took that kind of personal right there. That's, that's, I'll tell you, man. I, Polly, yeah. Polly, I mean, hurtful, man. Or as we like to say in this church, burtful. All right, Romans 5. We've got some things to do here. Quickly. 
Would you be? Sh- what's it? Oh, Jonathan, you, he got the. Oh, you have a, okay. How quick? Like four like, verses? Like a whole chapter when they had <laughs> had Guido read a. F- Maybe in Stafford there was. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we're talking about, kid. You know, we know. We know how you funded that second career, kid. <laughs> no. I'm talking about the Stafford Speedway. What's wrong with you people? Man, uh, the cloud of smoke. That is going to be... No, that's going to be... Give me a second here. I hear some weird giggling going on. It's troubling me. Go over... Nope, it's not there. Uh, I was thinking Hebrews 12, 8, but I guarantee you the companion is in Exodus. I just don't know where. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest, the sound of a trumpet, the voice of words, which voice they that heard, treated the word might not have spoken unto them. Um, I thought I know what you're talking about, the smoke. It's in a it's in a concordance with what Brother Bert out of Exodus 19 that I don't if you have it. I, I believe there's one in Job too. I'm sorry. All right, go to go to Rome, go to Romans. Uh, Romans. It's 19:12, isn't it? Or something that I don't. I don't know. I'm at. I don't know. Nine, I'm sorry. 19:18. Okay. You know what happens? You start thinking about it, and then you invent a Bible verse. I've done, I don't know how many, I've got my own Bible version going on in my head, man. I'm serious. You're like, uh, um, I mean, how, now this is not directed towards anybody in particular, but how has God mag, <clears throat> I gave it away. In Psalm 138, verse 2, did he exalt his word or magnify his word? No, I'm not being smart, because I always thought it was exalted. It's actually magnified. But you've heard it for so long misquoted that you, until you read it, you're like, I, exalted. Right? It's actually magnified, not exalted, even though you'd think because of the verse in Philippians 2, he's exalted the name of Jesus above every name, but he's actually magnified his word above all his name. That's a bizarre thing, man. But you think, because we've, we've all heard exalted for, I, I, honestly, years you hear that, and it gets ingrained in your, your squash. And then when you read it, you're like, oh, wow, okay. It's kind of weird, man. It said magnified. But then you go to this quote, and you uh, yeah, I've messed up so many scriptures. Oh, BTW, LOL, the place, I, I made a mistake on Sunday. The place where this revival is going on is in Kentucky not North Carolina. It's my fault. I think it's called Widmore, Kentucky is where the end of the colleges or university, Asbury. It's actually Asbury College or University. No, the, now I'm just going to say this. If you do a little bit of history, they've had a, they had a revival in 1905 in February, like 1920 in February, like 1935 in February. 1943 in like March. They they forgot it was it must have been a leap month. <laughs> but no, I'm not messing with you. And then they had like two or three Februarys in a row, one March, and then they had this one in February. I'm I'm not saying you pencil in revival, but isn't that weird? It only happened in February. I'm just some free to consider, man. Well, is God moving down there? Well, there's probably a God moving down there. Romans chapter number five. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. Let's look at the timing of this mystery. Mystery of the rapture. If you could, please, with me. As we've mentioned ad nauseum, probably too much, but I don't think you can say it enough, you and I as the body of Christ, and that has to be understood biblically by you and your heart and your mind, you, if you're saved, are part of the body of Christ. Okay? You are eternally secure. You're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You couldn't be lost if you tried. 
Now, that's going to get a lot of heat and it's going to get a lot of blowback because, well, you're just teaching that everybody can live the way they want. And Listen, the people that usually say that are usually the ones living the way they want to live. But they'll claim eternal security and say, I'm washing the blood forever so they can just justify what they're doing. Listen, there's nothing in the Word of God that says you shall just go sin because you're saved. God forbid, Romans 6.1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, put away that wicked person from among you, a brother who's fornicating with his stepmom. You don't tolerate it in the congregation. You don't deal with it. But you, as a saved person, that doesn't take you out of the body of Christ. That's essential, biblically speaking, to understand about the rapture. The rapture is the, the coming of the Lord in the clouds for the dead. Where? In, and we which are alive remain shall be caught together... So that means the ones that are alive are where? In, if you're in Christ, your head is Jesus Christ. He's coming to get his body back. You're in Christ, never to be removed out of that body. You're not going through the tribulation period for a month, a week, a day, 22, 23, 30, none of it. It's the time of Jacob's trial. Well, we're pre-wrath. You're stupid. You don't even understand what that means. You heard somebody quoted who somebody quoted who somebody quoted, and now they're quoting it again the last five, six, seven years. You don't even know what pre-wrath means. Well, you know, uh, we get out when it really gets bad. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. What event takes place for the New Testament believer when we go home to glory? If you are pre-wrath and you go up, this is what I've heard these people teach. Well, you go up, get judged, and come, turn right back around come down on your horse. Where's the marriage of the Lamb? I, now, I do believe the supper's on the earth. I don't have any problem with that at all because you've got guys trying to get in without a, oh, with a, without a garment and all that stuff. And I, it, that's just a different gig with the male virgins and all that stuff. It's just, I believe the marriage takes place and the supper's down here on the earth. Uh, that's why he says, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. We use that for church membership. That's not it. It has something doctrinally completely different. It has nothing to do with the New Testament body of Christ. I just personally believe the supper is on the earth. The bride makes herself ready. You have the marriage. Boom, you come back and go have the supper. Honeymoon time for a thousand years. you got a bunch of people that take place. Maybe even the marriage is down here. I don't even know. Because you got guests. you got John the Baptist who's a friend of the bridegroom. you got all kinds of stuff going on. Point being is that you've got a lot of events to take place if you think you're pre-wrath. We're going to the judgment seat of Christ, folks. While all the madness is going on down here, which includes the first three and a half years of the covenant that is, quote-unquote, peaceful. Uh, just very quickly, do you folks know who the son of perdition is? Who's the son of perdition? Who is Judas Iscariot according to John 6, 70? He's a devil, the son of perdition. Who's locked in the center of the earth right now with his name, Abaddon and Apollyon? What's he called? The king over the bottomless pit. He's released. So whoever that thing was that Judas became in the flesh, that's what's going to come out and inhabit whatever the body is. Henry Kissinger, Ronald Wilson Reagan, what other knucklehead do you think he is? I remember Ronald Wilson Reagan was the Antichrist because it was Ronald 6, Wilson 6, Reagan 6. <sighs> I'm going to keep saying this. You know why you're not in the tribulation period? We're still here. Weird, man. I, I, you know what? I don't get bored of saying this because I feel extra snarky when I say this. You can't go five minutes without your phone. What are you going to do with 70-pound rocks start falling out of the sky? Sir, what's that, Brother Paul? You got a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of voices, man. <laughs> I know, I know. Sunday's coming, kid. Sunday's coming, man. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to say, Legion. I'm, that's what I'm. <laughs> yeah, that's him. No, he's got some bias. He's got a little bit of doctrine, but you know what? Hey, the familiar spirit in Acts 16, they, hey, they're the, they're the men of God show the way of salvation. So we gotta, we got to watch out for Brother Paul over there. But, I mean, come on, man. You, you can't make it when gas is five bucks a gallon. But, oh, you're brave, right? Well, we're going to go through three and a half years. You're something else, man. It, it, 
we're going to look at science. This is, you know, this is crucial because these people, folks, these, fo these people are all over the internet teaching this nonsense. I, it, it's all over the internet, whether they're preaching from a pulpit or they're in their basement with thinking Barney the Dinosaur snuggle cookie in the corner. <laughs> you know, I, this is my church and I'm the pastor and that's my member, Barney. He didn't tithe, so he's sitting over the corner. <laughs> you know, the internet pastor, the cool guy, yeah. the cool guy. He's all by, he's preaching himself. I, I actually saw a guy on the internet discipline a church member through the internet. You, you can't make this up, man. Only this day and age can you make it. You know what? As I said before, because I heard it from somebody who was a lot smarter than I, who said it, he goes, if you can't preach from this pulpit in another land the same thing, you ought to stop preaching it. Because you preach stuff to Americans you don't preach what fits Americans. You preach what, fit, what fits saved and lost. And you can take it to any country, any pulpit in the world. You don't have to you know, refine it to the American experience. Pfft, American Christianity is a joke, man. Romans chapter number one, quick. Let's, let's look at these. We, would you be shocked to know it's already 20 of 8? Can you believe it? Romans saying, you're loving life right now, aren't you, Paulie? Are you going through a, for a walk through the tombs after this or what, man? Yeah, I think so. I think. <laughs> I thought the grub part. Yeah, never mind. All right. <laughs> eat some. Eat some grubs or something. All right, man. All right, let's go. Let's do this. Romans chapter number uh, five. If you could, I'm going to have Megan read verses one through ten. Romans five one through ten. Let's let's clip through four of these quickly. Ha! I just said that because. Yes, Romans 5, 1 through 10, please. Yep. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace therein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Mm -hmm. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. Amen. For, for scarcely for a righteous man will, will one die, yet peradventure. You got it. I like the shoulder shake. Peradventure. <laughs> it is one of those crazy, it's that by chance thing from uh, Ecclesiastes. Go ahead. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. Much more than being have justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath throughout him. Through him. For if we for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, which more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now I understand the wrath here is the wrath that your sin will will come upon you if you die in your sins without Christ. But how much further does it go when you're justified by His blood and justified by faith and through faith is that God has taken you out of here because the verse that Megan read in verse number 10 says, if when we were what? Enemies. You're not an enemy of God anymore by your position in Jesus Christ. Can you become an enemy practically and spiritually by some of the things you do? Yes. But positionally, you're a child of God till the day you go home to glory and for all eternity, man, because of the blood that was applied to your account. But that blood extends not just from you escaping hell, what 100% it does, but you also escape the wrath that's coming down the road, which is all seven years, I believe. Now, I don't believe it's just down to three and a half. Could it have been before? Yes. Is it the full week now? Yes, I believe it's the full week now. You say well, you're talking out both sides of your mouth. No, I don't. I just know a way that God can make those verses apply if they had taken him in Acts 7. Do I know all the details? No, I do not. But I know that's the way it would have worked out. But it's one week according to Daniel. There's one week, and a week is seven years according to the book of Genesis. Well, how long did Jacob serve for his woman? Remember he served seven, and then what happened after that? 
And the Bible says he served what? One week. A week with the Lord is seven years. Don't you remember when we were studying Galatians like seven years ago when we started Galatians? Don't you remember what? Don't you remember? Don't you, don't you remember when it says a few days? And it was three years. You don't know how God counts time unless He defines it in the book, man. So this stuff about the the wrath and you know you're gonna you're gonna go through and then when it gets tough you're getting pulled out. Judgment seat of Christ issues, marriage uh, marriage of the Lamb issues, and a whole bunch of other. Moses and Elijah. What do you now? This next part's gonna will help you out after well, two parts. Here we go. Go to uh, go to First Thessalonians five. First Thessalonians five. Um, Taylor, First Thessalonians five. I'm just doing randomness right now. Yes, Paul. What's that? <laughs> man, what? Honestly, do you need a priest? <laughs> all right, man. All right, kid. I'm just. I'm gonna make sure I don't lose you tonight, man. I don't want to lose you, kid, to the pit. Seriously. First Thessalonians five one through eleven, please. There you go. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but there you go. to salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with us. He just told you the definition of wake or sleep in chapter 4. What happens at the end of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians? What's that event we've been studying? It's the rapture. It's the calling out of the body of Christ. But then he shifts gears, and what does he talk about in the first few verses of 1 Thessalonians 5? Second coming, thief of the night. That that day should not overtake you. That day won't overtake me. I'm coming back with him. I know perfectly when the second coming of the Lord is. You know why? Because I'm coming back down with him in Revelation 19. That day's not going to overtake me as a thief. But for the folks that are down here in the tribulation period, oh yeah, man. But did you see verse number 9? He's not appointed us to what? But to obtain, what's that word? You already got salvation the day you got saved, so it's got to be talking about a salvation benefit that's greater than just the day you got saved and put in the body of Christ. It's you getting pulled out of here before the day of the Lord happens. Isn't that cool how that's 5-9 and the other one's in Romans 5-9? Oh, they probably formulated that back 400 years ago. They probably sat down and said, we're going to really trip those people out in 2023. No. God's Holy Ghost put those verse and chapter and punctuations exactly where he want them so you'd go unbelievable father thank you i can't believe you gave me your mind on paper go with me to Re revelation 4 quick 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 revelation 4 uh revelation <laughs> revelation 4 1 karen please You know what? Because you've been a good kid. Can you read verse 2? And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Boy, doesn't immediately kind of make you think of twinkling of an eye? Mm -hmm. So in Revelation 4, verse number 1, what opens? A door. And what happens when that door opens? Uh, the, yeah, you're right. You're right, Kenny. Go ahead. You already you already messed me up with Second Timothy one. So go ahead. I heard the voice as it were of a what? What? How are you getting out of here? Sound of a trumpet. Immediately, you're up at the throne. Immediately. 
Now, I, this is not the only way you, that you teach people that they're not going through the rapture, save people. But it is, as we looked at Sunday morning, we'll do it again this, this Sunday morning, Lord willing, what just ended in chapters 2 and 3? The church age. And what happens in 4.1? John, a picture of the church goes where? And you don't see the church again until Revelation 22. Now, I understand those are tribulation assemblies. I know that. But as we saw Sunday, doctrinally, man, nothing to do with you, man. Go with me to Revelation 19. Quick, Revelation 19. So you saw heaven open, somebody goes up. Let's do this. Kenny, 19, 10 through 14. Actually, 11 through 14, please, Brother Kenny. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's awesome, man. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire, <sighs> and on his head were many crowns. Crown him with many, sorry, go ahead. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. His name is called. So if, you, if you're a Bible marker, which I hope you are, you should have John 1.1 1, 1 right next to that one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. Felt the moment? That's 114. That ties you off with the Word of God, capital W. It's a persona. It's Jesus Christ. Go ahead, Brother Kenny. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. I hate that part. Go ahead. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So you just had 1911, heaven open. Somebody comes down. 4-1, somebody goes up. No church in between. That's, I, I'm, that's not the only way to explain you're not going to be here. In fact, that's a cool way, but you need to explain and understand your position in Jesus Christ. That's why you're not going through the tribulation period. You've got to understand those promises and the wrath you were saved from and your sins being washed in the body of Christ and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, he, and sealed for until the day of redemption. The day of redemption is when God pops the lid on your do not open until date. And that's come up hither or death. Now we, we've got to do this very quickly. I know we're going quick. I don't mean to do that. If you have a question, submit in the suggestion box and we'll get to you. No, you can, you can ask the question anytime you want. So Proverbs chapter number 25. Proverbs 25. You, you folks that have been around, you probably know where I'm going with this, and that, that's okay. It's okay, man. Uh, Brother Burt, can you get 25, 1 through 7? Proverbs 25, 1 through 7. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Can I just make a quick comment, Brother Burt, just for two seconds? What, did you, what were those last two words you read of that verse? Do you have the originals in your hand? What do you have? An inspired copy. Well, I, what, did he tell, what did he tell Joshua to do in 832 of Joshua? When you get over in the promised land, why don't you cut and make yourself a copy? Oh, and if you're a king in Deuteronomy uh, 17, you know what you want to do if you're a king sitting on a throne? Why don't you sit down and write yourself a copy of the law so you can meditate in it? There's nothing wrong with a copy as long as it comes from the original preserved word of God. You've got, we've got copies all over. You've got copies in the back. We have the copies of God's word. Keep on going, Brother Burt, please. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. That's cool. The heaven for height and the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the fire. Amen. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Hmm. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Thank you. Go to Revelation 11, and we'll shut her down with this. Revelation 11. We already read the one in Revelation 4. Go to Revelation 11. I know many of you probably have it marked down, but be good for a quick refresher. Uh... 
Moses and Elijah are on the on the earth. Let's do this. Um, Justin, can you read eleven seven through twelve, please? So when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Mm. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. For you students of the Word of God, which we all should be, you just saw the three times that the Lord uses the phrase, come up hither in the King James Bible. One in Proverbs 25, 7, one in 4, 1, and one right here in chapter 11. One pictures the Old Testament saints, Matthew 27, and then their ascension when the Lord goes up. One pictures the rapture of the New Testament church, dead in Christ, and we were to alive. That's Revelation 4, 1. And one pictures the tribulation saints going up into glory. Blessed, okay. No, we're not doing it tonight. The Bible says there's a first resurrection and a second resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. You and I, as saved people, should know our part in the resurrection. Our part is the second part. The Bible many, many times refers to or typifies these happenings as like a harvest, a planting, a sowing, a reaping, and all that stuff. So you would refer to the Old Testament saints as first fruits, Feast of Unleavened Bread. You would refer to the New Testament saint in the body of Christ, the church, as the Feast of Pentecost, the harvest. And then you would refer to the last part, the tribulation saints, as the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. There's three parts to the first resurrection. Our part, if you're saved, is the second part. If you miss one of those three, you end up in the lake of fire. And don't think, well, I'll just wait to the tribulation period and take my chances. Mm. I would say more than likely not going to happen. I'd get saved now. You say you're threatening me. No, nah, I can't threaten you more than God's already done with you in your own heart, man, through the conviction of the Holy Ghost. But the timing of it is we are out of here before it happens. You know that by the things we read tonight. We'll look at some more next week. Not trying to belabor the point, but this thing, Paul was arguing with people back 2,000 years ago about it. It's a pretty important mystery. As we close, any questions or comments? I typically don't do that. James? Uh, just a question on the last uh, verse. Yep. 11, 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life mm -hmm. God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them who saw them. It says three and a half, it's three and a half days. So is that significant related to Christ's resurrection after the three days? It would be. Uh, I tend to lean towards his three and a half years of public ministry because it's three days and a half, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't get squirreled up either way about it. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering. No, that's, that's, a, that's a good pickup. And actually, I was going to say something, but I figured I'd just let it go because I don't have a firm answer on the three and a half days. Uh, excuse me, three days and a half. Yeah. I don't have a firm answer on it. You can get the similitude with the three and a half years. You can get the similitude with the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. No problem with that at all. That half a day kind of messes me up a little bit, to be honest with you. Yeah. Hundred percent. Is significant because that's when the Jews believe that your spirit had left the body. So I wasn't sure if that was relevant. 
which is crazy because, <laughs> okay, go to Ecclesiastes 12 quick. Sorry, Ecclesiastes 12. <laughs> no, we won't. Don't worry. Ecclesiastes 12. <laughs> oh, come on. Shut it down, you guys. Oh, now you're going to act all holy like, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Ecclesiastes 12. Just to give you, just to very quickly about the spirit. Yes, there are traditions. There are leaving the body out. Uh, I would say this is not just Jewish. Let's think about this for a quick second. I've been to many a Roman Catholic funeral, both as a lost man. I've actually served masses as an altar boy at funerals. And what do they say in these funerals? Oh, now receive our, now receive our sister. Oh, now please accept uh, our beloved brother, our brother, beloved, uh, beloved brother's spirit. You know, take him in the... No, man, the minute you die, you're gone. We sang it tonight. You, you, you die, you're cut off, and you fly away. The real you, your soul's gone, man. Your soul's not this disembodied, uh, ethereal cloud or mist, man. The soul is the real you. Revelation uh, chapter 6 says you can wear a robe. You have a voice. You have a memory in uh, Luke 16. You have eyes. You have thirst. You, the, the soul's the real you. When I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, you're just seeing the mobile home, the, the, the shell that is uh, carting around the real you. The real you is your soul, man. But there's something else. You are a what, according to 1 Thessalonians? Spirit first, a soul, and a body. Because we're Baptists and we're all overweight and we like to eat, we say body, soul, spirit. <laughs> no, it's spirit, soul, and body, stupid. Quote it right. I'm getting my quota in of stupids tonight. Twelve. Brother Bird's got his clicker like an umpire. Click. <laughs> click. <laughs> He's like, click, stoop. Yeah, there you go. Man, this thing's broken, man. Uh, I'll just read this for you, Brother James, in 12.7, if you could. 12, read Ecclesiastes 12.7. Uh, okay. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Quickly, go to Luke 23, quick. I know you guys are, oh, man, my pulse is racing. I don't know. I don't want I got to go, man. No. 23, quick, Luke 23, Luke 23, uh, verse 46, James, if you could, 23, 46, 23, 46 of Luke. Uh, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Last one, Acts 7, quick. Acts 7, quickly. I'll fly away, O oh glory, I'll fly away. Thank you. <laughs> Acts 7, James, if you could. Um, if you could, 59, 58, 59, 60. Acts 7, 58, 59, 60, please. Mm -hmm. And they stoned Stephen, Stephen or Stephen? No, that's okay. If you're in high school, call him Steph, and that's why he likes his yearbook sign. Go ahead. Uh, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell Okay, last one, James 2. I'm serious. I can't help it, man. I'm addicted, man. It's good for you. I'm addicted. Just thinking Bible, Bible crack, man. It's Bible crack, man. Uh, James. James. James 2.26. James. James 2. <laughs> hey, you're one of the 12, 12 tribes scattered abroad, man. <laughs> uh, 2.26, man. 2.26. To, to, uh, James 2, verse 26, please. 2.26, uh, two please. Right. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. 
So the minute you die, and actually part of biblical death is the breath of life leaves you. It's gone. And where does it go? It goes back to the creator, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, who gave it. How did God form man? And what, how did he give him life? How does God take life back? Give me that breath. I haven't been around a lot of death. The folks that are medical uh, professionals, all kidding aside, and they're around that, they usually go, or there's some expulsion, expelling of that breath. Don't they call it a death breath or death rouse? It's like the... And that's it. That's God pulling the spirit back, but the soul is, the, is the, what the key thing is. The spirit goes back to God because God is the father of all spirits. That's in uh, Hebrews 12. He's the father of all spirits. In other words, he's the, one that, he's the one that gives life to all. But when you die, it's immediate. That spirit goes back to God. The body goes to wherever, whether it's internment in the ground or in, a, in, a, in an urn or if you're on the deck of the uh, you know, Indianapolis and you go get eaten by a shark or something like that. Sorry for the Jaws reference. Or if you get something like that. I mean, your body goes wherever your body lays. That's it. But that soul, man. That soul, the minute you, that breath leaves you and you die, that soul goes off, off to either God's heaven or a devil's hell. And you have no choice after that where you stay. It's done while you're living. But when that spirit, so that three and a half days, now they, this is how disrespectful that is, and we got to go. That's how disrespectful that you typically, when you had a body and, you, and it was dead, the thing to do was to either cover it up or to shroud it up or to get... They're so disrespectful to these two preachers. They hate them so much. They leave right in the street. They're like, I can guarantee you they're spitting on them while their heads are cut off. and That's how they die. That's how the Antichrist kills them. That's in Zechariah 5. He's going to cut their heads off in the tribulation period. And they're going to be, they're dead bodies. That was specific, just like John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Elijah's, that's John, gets, they get their heads cut off. They're going to just, this so disrespectful. Lay the body. And God's going to go, Come up hither. 144,000. They're up on the heavenly Mount Zion with the Lamb. That's Revelation 14. But they're on the earth for Revelation 17. That's your third part of the first resurrection. That's the tribulation of saints led by Moses and Elijah. The law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah. And Jesus Christ is grace. That's why you have law, prophets, and grace on the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, I pray for us. Please, if you could. I think the battery died. We killed everything, man. <laughs> <laughs> Father, I just want to thank you for the study we've been going through. And that we can have just faith in your word. That we won't be here during that time, Father. There's yeah. so much foolishness going on in this world. And just even people who are saved that think that they're going through some part or if not all. I just want to thank you that we can have your word to stand on. And to know for sure that we won't be there during that time. We'll be with you, Father. And Amen. I just want to thank you just for your word, how true it is, how we can stand on it. Just help us be in your word every day to open our mouths for you and help us to hide your word in our heart. Just to use it for you and help it so that we don't sin against you as well. Yeah, amen. I just uh, want to thank you just for those who are here who truly want to know your word and just be in the preaching and teaching of your word. And help us to stand sure for you, not for ourselves. And I pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Mo's probably tied up running.